Thank you very much to the uh, NATO Cyber Center of Excellence for um, inviting me and, and hosting this, this wonderful conference. Uh, it is uh, truly a, a privilege uh, to, to be here and an honor, and I, I hope I speak for my, my fellow uh, speakers when I say thanks, Pascal, for all the work you did uh, in getting us ready for this, uh, both from our papers and the articles for the book uh, and the presentations. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today about um, countermeasures in the context of state behavior in cyberspace. And specifically, I, I, I'm going to draw a couple of analogies to some uh, historical analogies to uh, the law of the submarine. I mean, I'll, if you think about uh, what Admiral Rogers said, I am a naval officer, so I come from the, at this from a naval perspective, uh, and I bring a little bit of that, as you'll see, into this presentation. Next slide, please. So after North Korea um, and Sony last year, Am uh, President Barack Obama you know, made the statement, uh, we'll respond in a place and time and manner that we choose. Uh, a statement that raised, potentially for international lawyers, a lot more questions um, than it really answered about well, what, what does that mean? Uh, what, what do you mean by respond? Are we talking self-defense? Are we talking something else? Um, Jeff DeWeese is going to talk about imminence criteria with self-defense, and, and I'm going to talk about and focus on the something else. Um, we have seen North Korea was really just the latest, most blatant example of a string of state activity that has been bubbling up to the surface in cyberspace, beginning with Estonia 2007, um, widely attributed to Russian interests, Georgia 2008, Stuxnet 2009, 10, Saudi Aramco, Iranian DDoS against U.S. banks in 2012, uh, all the way now to Sony, uh, increasingly disruptive uh, activities that are seen to be accomplished, attributed in anonymous fashion to state actors and to states. So, and, and yet this is all being done in a manner that is um, anonymous, unattributed, unacknowledged, uh, and that's because the characteristics, we're here to talk about at this conference, the architecture, um, and, and that architecture allows for this sort of deniability aspect to occur in state activities, and states are taking advantage of that architecture. They are pursuing national interests in cyberspace in a manner that is unattributed and unacknowledged. So with that observed, potentially observed, state behavior, how do we account for um, that behavior under international law? Uh, was Saudi Aramco, was the Iranian DDoS indeed a response to Stuxnet? Was that a type of countermeasure uh, done by the Iranians? Um, if so, you know, how does that comport and, and, and fit into the law of countermeasures? Did it? Does it? Can it? As it currently exists? That's the problem. Uh, and, and my thesis, my proposal is we need to, to make some modifications. We need to think about modifications to the law of countermeasures or the law of countermeasures is going to be laid to waste, it's going to be ignored by states given the way that they are currently behaving in cyberspace. We can discuss and quibble about what the modifications may look like, um, whether there's a different solution. I think the key thing, as I discussed with Pascal, is recognizing that there is a problem and the scope of the potential problem going forward in the future because of the way states behave in cyberspace and, the, and my belief that that is not going to change. Next slide. So Judge Easterbrook, a U.S. judge in the Seventh Circuit, um, at a conference way back now in 1996, uh, talked about the fact that we don't need specialized cyber law courses in law school, right? When we transitioned from the horse and buggy to the automobile, we didn't have 
classes on the law of the horse. We had in law school classes that discussed general principles, and then we took those principles and we applied them to the new medium, the automobile. And his point was we need to do the same thing with cyber. And to the extent that there is a problem with law, the fact that there is an inexactness in law that cyber highlights, cyber should be the catalyst to correct law. Now, to be fair, um, I don't know that Judge Easterbrook's views have carried the day. He you know, was countered by guys, by, by individuals, academics like Lawrence Lessig, internet advocates, um, and most law schools, I went to GW for my LLM, have a class in cyber law now, where it is a specialized course on applying specific kinds of law in cyber, whether it's intellectual property or um, privacy law or Fourth Amendment search and seizure law in cyberspace. Um, now what we have, carrying the day for Judge Easterbrook, his principle sort of wins the day more on the international side. Um, you know, we have, we have states like the United States, I think, leading the way in saying, as Judge Easterbrook did, hey, international law that we have now is sufficient. We may need new norms, but the law we have in place governs and is workable in cyberspace, right? Our international strategy, the old one, um, the high-level one by the government said, international norms apply in cyberspace. <coughs> um, Harold Coe, legal advisor, State, State Department legal advisor, said the same thing at a legal conference at the, at the U.S. Cyber Command when I was in, this, in the Staff Judge Advocate's office there in uh, 2012, the next year. We finally have international agreement that at least international law applies in cyberspace. The 2013 UN Group of Government Experts um, made that statement in their report to the United Nations. The 2010 version from that same group did not have that statement. They could not agree. Um, there still are disagreements about implementation and application. Russia still says we need a new treaty. The Chinese still say, hey, you, you know, how this applies. There's uncertainty over application. Well, we can agree with a broad principle, but, um, you know, there's uncertainty over application. I think there's actually going to be a presentation uh, later this afternoon to discuss some of that uncertainty. Um, as we move then, next slide please, um, I, I, I sort of ta have taken the view, I used to be on the side that said we did not need a new treaty. I, I've come around to a different approach, we need to make some modifications. Um, I think that, that uh, this is a little bit of a head in the sand approach that the, the U.S. is leading here. Um, and, and it stems in part from the fact that states like and are using unattributed, unacknowledged cyberspace operations. And as Jack Goldsmith said in the wake of North Korea, the attribution of North Korea, uh, Sony to North Korea by the United States, um, this kind of activity prevents the development of norms. If doing things in the way that states are, are doing does prevent norm development, prevents the discussions from occurring um, at the state to state level. States aren't leading the discussion. Academics are leading the discussion. The Talon Manual, version 1 and 2.0, are leading the discussion. The risk here is that international law will be ignored. Right? I'm an international lawyer. I consider myself to be one. Um, and, and that risk, I think, is real. It's substantial, and it's not without precedent. Um, there's a very good book by a young naval officer, Ira Joel Holwit, the book is called Execute Against Japan, the U.S. Decision to Conduct Un Unrestricted Submarine Warfare. And that book basically goes through in detail and describes how the U.S. position on unrestricted warfare that was announced and implemented within four and a half hours of Pearl Harbor had developed over the course of the preceding decade and how Unrestricted submarine warfare was inconsistent, not consistent with the international law treaties that the United States had signed up to in the 30s. And that remained in effect to this very day with the U.S. as signatories. Um, 
the cruiser rules, those cruiser rules where you had to stop a, um, you know, if you were a surface vessel, you wanted to sink and seize a merchant vessel, um, you had to stop that vessel, you had to get the crew to a place of safety, um, and a lifeboat was not considered a place of safety. All those rules were untenable for submarines in the way submarines operated in the deniable global undersea environment where they sneak up on the, on the, the ship and their adversary and they shoot them, right? So that was widely known and acknowledged and discussed within the Navy, and the decision had been made that upon the outbreak of war, we were going to declare unrestricted submarine warfare regardless of what we had previously signed up to. And that was actually implemented within four hours of, of uh, Pearl Harbor. Um, and he makes the case very effectively that, that that was not consistent with our obligations under international law and that we ignored international law knowingly. Today, states, I, I would submit, face the same dilemma with respect to cyberspace, right? We had the Tala Manual come out, address use of force, armed attack, um, and, and in that, they also acknowledged that as of that writing, and I would submit even to this day, nothing has yet risen to the level of an armed attack. And Tala 2.0, I think, is addressing the, the broader scope, the more problematic area of what about sub-use of force? What about activities and operations that fall below the level of an armed attack and a use of force, where self-defense is not available? Where countermeasures are the most viable option under, under international law, potentially, to address this kind of malicious cyber activity. Um, but I don't think the current uh, framework is compatible with demonstrated state behavior that I discussed earlier. Why is that a problem? Next slide, please. If we look at the difficulties in applying the law of countermeasures, um, you, 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 you see that, that the conditions and limitations of countermeasures are, are, can, be, can be viewed as very stringent, right? So first, you can only undertake a countermeasure um, in response to an internationally wrongful act by another state. You must first determine the activity is, in fact, a wrongful act, and you must have some type of attribution to that other state, to the sending state. Um, so for instance, the U.S., after initially denying, um, within a week turned it around and attributed the uh, malicious cyber activity on Sony to North Korea. Um, and it's worth noting that the methods they used to make that attribution uh, were very consistent with some of the most well-known um, reports generated by forensics companies um, like Mandiant, FireEye, even Kaspersky, right? But it was not without controversy from those within the information security community. That attribution to North Korea remains controverted in that community to this day. Although I think the, from a U.S. government standpoint, it's fairly resolved. Um, it may not involve the use of force, right? So non-forcible countermeasures. This is fairly easy to achieve in cyberspace. That's one of the things that makes cyber countermeasures so attractive is you, you have the ability to do things like uh, when the Department of Defense was subjected to flood net attacks and Heather Harrison Dennison um, uh, documents the fact that the DOD in, in the United States took a response that res in, ended up shutting down browsers uh, from the uh, machines that were sending these flood net attacks. So from shutting down a browser to uh, taking other kinds of actions, such as <coughs> um, suborning a botnet, using a command and control channel for a botnet to send uh, commands to the botnet to either stop its action, to delete itself, uh, to hack back, right? Where the classic hack back active defense of go in, either retrieve data, um, delete malicious software, um, corrupt somebody's system in a reversible manner so that they can't conduct the offending activity. You have a range of countermeasures that end up not rising to the level of use of force. You have a lot of things that can be done uh, that, that aren't really going to get you close to the level of an armed attack or a use of force because there's no dying, there's no injuries, there's no significant destruction. 
Um, they also don't rise to the kind of uh, severity or invasiveness and uh, measurability of effects that the Tollan manual, for instance, uh, among other factors, suggest would be e e equal to a use of force conclusion. Um, so it, it's very attractive to use cyber countermeasures. And they're also very easily temporarily and they can be very temporary and very reversible, easily done with non-forcible cyber countermeasures. Now, we start getting into some of the conditions that raise problems. Um, and the, one of the big ones is the fact that a countermeasure may only be taken against the state that is committing the internationally wrongful act. Well, this becomes a problem when you're looking at issues like the Iranian DDoS against U.S. banks, where you have botnets and robots that are suborned uh, computers in over 60 countries, including the United States. Uh, other cyber activity pose problems due to using infrastructure in third-party states. For instance, the North Korea uh, attribution activity against uh, Sony is alleged to have used cyber infrastructure that was located in China. So this becomes an issue when you're trying to uh, conduct a cyber countermeasure and some of your countermeasures, the things I discussed previously, may have effects or occur inside or need to be occurring inside the quote unquote territorial boundaries of a third state in order to be effective. Next slide please. You get into some other conditions. The law of countermeasures says, hey, you can only conduct your countermeasure if the internationally wrongful act is ongoing, which in cyber raises the question of what does that mean? How is that interpreted? Does it reach? Does it have to be you know, ongoing? Can it be a pattern? For instance, in the Iranian DDoS, they would do DDoS activity, distributed denial of service, they would stop, they'd do it a couple days later, stop, they'd look for reflections and things in the newspaper potentially, then they'd do it again, and it's kept up for a period of months from September 2012 into 2013. So discrete acts repeated over time. Can I take my countermeasure uh, only when the DDoS is actively occurring? Or can I take some action in the lull between, counter, between DDoS to prevent the next session from, from happening? Um, what about a continuing course of conduct that, that North Korea might represent? You're in Sony, you get your data, you get out, right? That's a discrete act. But now this data is made available on the internet. Private information is being released. There's additional information being released. There are continuing impacts occurring within um, the, the territory of your nation? Can you get to an internationally wrongful act for that level of activity? Can you attribute it? Is, it, is that part of the ongoing uh, obligation to not intervene uh, in the economic, political, and social affairs of another country that would allow you to take a countermeasure in response? Is it response just to the intrusion in the Sony or what you do afterwards? So this, this is a problem that comes up when you're trying to apply a cyber countermeasure to cyber activity. Finally, uh, there is this issue of notification. And what, you, what states must do is uh, have some type of basically notification to the offending state, hey, you need to stop what you're doing, that's the internationally wrongful act. The current law from the draft articles on state responsibility contemplate an extended period of negotiation prior to the use of countermeasures. Uh, in, in cyber, this is not very feasible. It's not realistic. You will lose the ability to conduct an effective cyber measure if this happens. You also have an obligation under current law to provide notice of the intent to take countermeasures to the offending state. Sort of the one last, hey, stop it or we're going to do something in response. Um, now, there is an exception here. And the exception is, unless that urgent countermeasure is needed to remain effective, then you don't have to do the second notice. And I would submit that that's the exception that will be the rule, the norm, in cyberspace. Next slide, please. So, finishing up real quick, so I can leave some time for questions. How do I propose to resolve this, these problems, these countermeasure difficulties I've identified? Um, first thing, 
I would modify the notification requirement. States, I would submit, are going to do what they're going to do anyway. They're going to continue to use cyberspace in this manner. Um, and so the exception for countermeasure efficacy uh, should apply to both notification provisions. Shift to prompt notification after the fact, right? Hey, we took a countermeasure, um, and that's why your activity stopped or ceased and why you weren't able to have uh, the kind of effect that you thought you were having. Uh, now stop it, or we're going to do it again or maybe more, right? I would submit that states need this in order to retain the efficacy of cyber countermeasures because it's too easy, once you know something's coming, to be able to defend against it. And states know that as well. Second, rather than discrete acts, the focus should be on a broader obligation to, of states not living up to their international obligation. Whether that's for the discrete, I mean, that's for the extended period of time or for impacts stemming from an international wrongful act. Um, it may be that we can get there now under current law based on interpretation, but if you take a real strict look and reading of that law, it doesn't fit a lot of cyber activity. Finally, and probably most controversially, I would propose that um, although we take action against the offending state, there's going to be a lot of times in cyberspace where that action against the offending state is going to occur in infrastructure territory of a third party state. And we have to resolve that issue and get to a point where that activity can occur and can occur at the speed that is required to deal with the malicious activity, the offending international wrongful act, um, or states are just going to do it anyway and not tell anyone. What I would suggest and submit is we do it, we make sure we do it as minimal as possible, that we do it in a manner um, that is only what is needed for the, the threat that you face, and then ensure that you communicate with that third state afterwards that this is the action we had to take, and this is why we could not alert you ahead of time. Um, and we've seen an example where this, this attempt to use the strict countermeasures of trying to use the notification to a third state to achieve um, their help and assistance has not proven effective. The United States notified 120 nations uh, to try and get them to help with the Iranian DDoS situation, and it did not lessen the impact, um, the, the, the strength of those DDoS actions at all, as documented, documented in a Washington Post article written by Ellen Nakashima. These limited actions, I would submit, don't, are not going to impinge unduly on the third state's interest. Um, and I would make that comparison by saying, look, under our current law, our current framework of countermeasures, indirect effects are allowed. If we have economic sanctions on Iran and a company in Belgium who does most of their business with Iran goes bankrupt, that's okay under countermeasures now. And I'm su suggesting that, that taking an action as described up there, deleting some software that is unknown and unwanted by the state and the system user is, is a lot less offensive and is a lot less impactful than those kinds of bankruptcies that are considered indirect effects now. So that's my proposal to modify the law of countermeasures to account for observed state behavior and what I think is going to be future state behavior going forward. I'll take your questions. No, you later. <laughs> Yes, uh, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, Kubo Machak from the University of Exeter. Uh, sir, you opened with a quote from President Obama who uh, mentioned the word proportionality. And in fact, I would like to hear your opinion on that requirement because this is also one of the requirements traditionally considered to form a part of the law of countermeasures. In fact, the, the requirement of proportionality of the measures taken. And perhaps you could uh, use this opportunity to contrast the law of countermeasures and the law of self-defense, whereas in the law of self-defense, we know that proportionality is taken to mean proportionality 
needed to repel the attack, so the aim would be to repel the attack on, uh, in question. In the law of countermeasures, proportionality is traditionally seen rather as proportionality to the attack itself. And I wonder whether we might take the cue from the law of self-defense, and potentially this could be one of the parts of your proposal, one of the directions in which the law might need to change in order for the responses to cyber threats to be effective. Thank you. Well, I, I would say that the law of proportionality as, a, as it's currently stands in countermeasures is, is sufficient. I don't, I don't know that we need to change that aspect, right? Because the proportionality in countermeasures is your response must be proportional to the harm that you're facing, not to the threat that you're facing. So the threat in self-defense can be much bigger. You can, your response can be much bigger than it can be in countermeasures. And I think that that's an important aspect that needs to be retained in countermeasures because it, it, that's, that's one of the limiting factors. That's one of the things that prevents countermeasures from getting into the escalatory uh, problem that some people have have identified as a, as a potential, but if you, if you take a countermeasure that is narrowly focused and narrowly designed to counter just the harm that's being suffered, right, um, then you're not getting expansive. If, if you change that and try and, and say, well, no, let's make it like, like self-defense and make it proportional to the threat we face, now you've expanded the scope of what a countermeasure could be used for. I don't, I don't think that that's consistent and consonant with the overall thrust of what countermeasures is designed to, because my modification is designed to continue having an effective body of international law for the same purposes, just one that's not ignored. I, oh, Prish. the uh, same thing, I'm uh, Prashant from India, cyber lawyer, and uh, the countermeasures and the proportionality, what we're talking about, now, if we have attacks which don't harm life or property, and in the countermeasures, if we aim at the measures we take, ultimately harms life and property, then that, that doesn't balance the countermeasure every state takes. What's your call on that? Well, I would suggest that that's not going to be considered a legal countermeasure. The countermeasure that, um, if you start talking about uh, a countermeasure that harms life and property, you, you're you're into a forcible countermeasure which can't be used and so that would not be an appropriate countermeasure. Mike? So uh, Mike Schmidt from the Naval War College. Paul, your stuff is always very interesting and provocative. Uh, I'm unconvinced that it's uh, such a problem as you suggest. For example, I'll just give you one example. When you talk about third states, this would be resolved in great part by the due diligence obligation that those states have to control cyber infrastructure on their territory to make sure it's not used to the detriment of other states. So I, I, it's, it's interesting, I agree with many of the problems, but I think you overstate the case. But your whole presentation begs the biggest question. The biggest question is how? How are you going to do this? You must remember that the law of state responsibility from which countermeasures emanates is not treaty law. It's, it's arguably customary law. Remember that the International Law Commission started work on the Articles of State Responsibility in 1949, and it took over half a century to agree on the draft articles, which have still to date not been put into treaty form. So uh, accepting everything you say, Paul, how in the world is this going to come into law? Uh, certainly not by treaty, which would then require state practice and opinion juris, which would mean that if the United States adopted those rules, it would have to be in breach of the existing rules for a period until the customary norm crystallized. So great proposal, but, but how? So I, I would say two answers, Mike. Uh, you're right, the, the discussion, the body of law that, that I'm talking about is a customary international law uh, structure. It is not based on treaty law. Um, I, I think this is something that could be solved with a treaty, though. I mean, if you, if you were willing to, to say, this is how we want to behave, and this is how we have been behaving, you know, treaty is one way to do it. You don't have to then wait for the development of customary international law norms to occur and be recognized and develop over time, where states could say, look, this is what we're all going to sign up to. And maybe that has a deterrent effect then. It'll prevent states from doing internationally wrongful acts in cyberspace if there's a recognized and known procedure for how you're going to get slapped down for doing that. 
uh, and it's going to be something, I mean, the, the other thing that I bear in mind with my proposal, right, is the issue of reciprocity, right? If a state were to proceed with this model, right, and, and I've had some discussions, um, you arguably can take, and I've, I've heard people take interpretations of existing law and stretch it to, to basically do something akin to what I'm suggesting, um, and, and then, but how is that behavior going to be identified and known and become transparent? A treaty would be a way to say, look, this is how we're going to behave, and this is how we're going to react to these things that are sub-use of force. Um, so I would, I, would, I would concur 100% with you. It is a problem in the development of the norm, um, but it can be resolved if states want to do it with a treaty. Um, otherwise, it's going to just take a while for observed state behavior to say, what? what the, I, mean, the, they're, I think they're going to ignore the law and the breach anyway. Sorry. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we have to stop this uh, on the topic. Here's your oh. second present. Thank you very much for your very relevant. Uh, uh, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you for this presentation, especially after lunch. Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. Thanks.